Let God's people say amen. We gather to celebrate world communion. We know that as a part of God's global family, we come together to affirm that we are a part of brothers and sisters around the world, that we come to receive together the forgiving grace of God and to commit ourselves to sharing that same grace. And so I'm glad you're here, and I hope this worship will be meaningful on your journey of faith. Uh, as we gather, I would uh, offer a couple of dates for you. Uh, one is uh, the 23rd of October. Uh, Pastor Cheryl has uh, r- gotten someone who is gifted at helping us to release stress through art. And so on that Saturday morning, all of you are welcome to come, and uh, we will learn a little bit more about what it means to uh, be able to release our stress through beauty. And so I hope you'll put that date on your calendar. I also would tell you that on the week of October 10th, our church, along with uh, Methodist churches and all denominations of churches, are uh, investing in an interfaith justice coalition, uh, trying to work in Johnson and Wyandotte County with um, systemic issues of injustice. And so the first step of that is being a part of listening sessions. And so you may be invited to a listening session on the, t- uh, on the week of the 10th of October. Uh, There will be several sessions to choose from, and we would invite you to say yes to that. It really is just a matter of um, speaking out about what you believe or what you see to be uh, injustices or things that we might work together as churches throughout Johnson County uh, to to make the world a better place for those who are in greatest need. So again, that's the week of October 10th, and you may be uh, receiving invitations to that over the next 10 days or so. I also would tell you that uh, next Sunday we will kick off our Better Together financial stewardship campaign through the month of October. Uh, I'm excited about the theme and uh, am very thankful that we have an opportunity to continue uh, to expand the vision that God has for ministry at this church uh, for 2022. And that's what we'll be talking about over the next several weeks. So I'm happy for you to be a part of that and be uh, watching, I'm sure with bated breath, uh, for an email or, or for a snail mail that will come that will tell you a bit more about that campaign. As we come to uh, our worship this evening, we are talking about how it is that Paul says to us in uh, Corinthians that of all the gifts God has given us, the greatest of these is love. And so uh, as we begin this evening, hear these words of welcome. Jesus as mystery is indeed the Christian faith's greatest spiritual enigma, a human being who is fully God. That is what Christianity proclaims, that beyond our wildest imaginings, the ever-creating love of the cosmos made its way into our small, hurting world, living and dying with us and for us, and promises never, never, never to leave us alone. Love is in the world and inside of us, dwelling with us even as we dwell in it. So where is Jesus? He is right here. Let us give thanks for that and uh, come into worship with this opening hymn. Love divine, oh love excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown, Jesus thou. to uh, time for our children, uh, we come understanding that uh, the best gift we can give them is the gift of love. Uh, how Stacy will help them understand that love in this month is their individuality and how it is that God has made them unique to do unique things for God's world. And so I'd invite you to gather your short-leggeds around you and uh, enjoy this word from Stacy. 
Hello friends, I am so glad you're here. We are starting off a brand new month, but before we do, there's something I need to know. Raise your hand if you love candy. I know there are so many different kinds, aren't there? Have you ever been in one of those shops where they allow you to customize the bag with exactly the candy you like? I mean, imagine it. Shelves lining the walls, bins of every type of candy imaginable. Now, you might not like it all, but that's what's so great. You can pick exactly what you like. I mean, maybe you like to add gummy bears to your jelly beans and then top it all off with a cup of M&Ms. Or maybe you like the hot candy or sour is more your thing. How about, do you like to mix the Skittles and the M&Ms and see if you can tell which one is which? I love it. We can all have a custom creation of our candy. We're all different, and that's not a bad thing. That's individuality, and that's what we're talking about this month. Individuality is discovering who you're meant to be so you can make a difference. And just like we can make our own custom creation, did you know you are a custom creation? God made each one of us special and different. Maybe God made you with brown hair or a good singing voice or a great personality. As you grow up, you'll discover all the amazing ways that God made you. But that's not all. In Genesis, the first book in the Bible, we read that our world began with God's wind sweeping over the waters. God spoke and the world came into existence. The sun and the stars, the plants and the animals. And then we read this. God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them, male and female. That means boy and girl. God created them. Did you hear that? You are made in God's image. Now that doesn't mean that God has the same eye color as you or your quirky smile. It does mean that you were designed for God to shine through you. You were made to show the world God's love, God's mercy and grace, God's kindness, God's patience, God's peace. God's wisdom. You and every person you will ever meet are valuable because you were made in the image of God. And here's what's even more amazing. God didn't make us just to be little robots, acting the same, behaving the same, looking the same. Instead, the more time you spend with God, allowing God to work in you, the more you become uniquely, well, you. And as you follow Jesus and reflect God's love to others, you will be able to do things that God has designed for you and no one else. So next time you look in the mirror, remember, you are looking at the image of God and no one in this world can, can reflect God the way you do. And that's the one thing to remember today. You were made in God's image. Now, as we start this month learning about all the custom creations we are from God, we also celebrate World Communion Sunday. World Communion Sunday is a day when we celebrate the uniqueness of us all by coming together with the one thing we do have in common, loving God and God's love for us each and every one of us. Jesus showed us what it means to be created in God's image and the way he loved other people and helped people feel like they had value, no matter who they are or what they had done. So today on World Communion Sunday, the love of Jesus brings us together, no matter where we live, what language we speak, the color of our skin, the different talents we have, all around the world today, we remember God's love in Jesus by taking communion together. In our differences, we are celebrating God's love shining through us. It's going to be a great month as we discover who we're meant to be and how we are to make a difference for God. And I can't wait to see you next week as we continue. As Stacy reminds each one of us, God has work for us to do. And God has work for God's children to do who are living all over the world. 
And so as we accept one another, as we empower and support one another, we know that God's vision for heaven coming to earth is one that we will be a part of helping to bring to pass. Uh, To have the strength and the power to do that means that we go to God in prayer. We allow ourselves intentionally to be embraced by God and know that in that sacred space, God may indeed call, make a call on our lives. I would invite you to prepare your hearts and spirits for this time of prayer. Let's rest in a moment of silence before we pray. Gracious and holy God, we worship you through song, prayer, and spoken word, and we celebrate your gift of grace that is through Christ Jesus on this World Communion Day. Coming together in our community of faith renews our strength and our joy. We don't escape from the world here, but instead we intentionally renew our focus on you and your love which defines our hope. As we celebrate life, you are with us. As we grieve, you comfort us. As life goes along, you are there. In hard times and times of joy, you journey with us. Forgive us when we as individuals or communities and even nations seek our own counsel and guidance instead of looking to you. And when we wait until times of desperation to see if you have anything to offer us. We need your counsel and your inspiration about so many important things for the world. Immigration policies and relationships between countries, arms races and armed conflict, responsible use and fair distribution of the resources that you've given us stewardship over. God, we haven't been able to solve these complex issues without you, so may we all seek your ways and your truth through prayer and reflection, and holy conversations, and prevent any of us or any group from insisting that we are the only ones who see the whole truth or offer the only way. Forgive us when we make those who disagree with us our enemies. Bless us and multiply our efforts when we are generous, when we find ways to compromise, when countries commit to resolve differences in peace talks, when we fight for the rights of those who have been denied a voice and are left powerless, when we protect the earth, and when we are kind to one another. In it all, we remember that you are our God and we are your people. And we offer these prayers to you in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. the love of God working in our hearts that enables and empowers us to reach beyond the walls of this church. As we start thinking and praying about uh, our stewardship, our financial stewardship for 2022, um, we do well to uh, be grateful for what has happened in 2021. In a year that has continued to be one that is a roller coaster, um, grace has been a place of stability Uh, a safe place for people to feel like they can come and be heard, and a place that continues to reach out to folks uh, with greater and greater need. And so we thank you for the faithfulness that you continue to show through the giving of your tithes and offerings in all the different ways that are listed. And we invite you to, again, be in prayer about how God will challenge us and invite us to be a part of a giving family in this next year as well. Let us continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray together. Loving and living God, we come before you with humble hearts, most especially on this World Communion Sunday. We come knowing that you are a God of all times and all places, that the, the lines that are boundaries of nations and places are ones that we have put up, not you. You see your world as one great gift. Help us to catch that same vision as we reach out with what we have and who we are, as we commit to you that we will live generous lives and that we will be cheerful givers. God, help us to know that as both givers and receivers, we are blessed to be blessings and that you first are the one who has given to us. And for that, we give you grateful thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Invite you now to prepare your hearts and spirits for these readings from the scripture. Our first lesson today comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34. Moses and the children of Israel have reached the promised land, but not yet entered into it. Here Moses is allowed a glimpse of the land before he dies and is buried in the land of Moab, beginning in verse 5. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. May God add God's blessing to the reading and the hearing of these words. If you would please stand, if you are able, for the gospel reading. Reading from the gospel of Mark, chapter 14, where Jesus makes preparation for the Passover and then celebrates what we know as the Lord's Supper with his disciples. Beginning in verse 14. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to Jesus, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh, no. 
in the tongues of men and of angels, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have all prophetic powers and understand all mystery and all knowledge and have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and render my body up to the flames that I may boast, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love endures. Love abides. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will cease, and as for tongues, they will be stilled, and as for knowledge, it will end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when, we, when the complete comes, the partial will disappear. When we were children, we thought like children, we reasoned like children, we spoke like children, but when we became adults, we put childish ways behind us. Now we see through the glass darkly. Then we shall see face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall know completely, even as we have been completely known. And these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Now you may be wondering... If Pastor Cheryl made just a horrible mistake in the scriptures she read because she did not read that scripture and she absolutely did not make a mistake. But you see, if we're going to deal with the end of Moses' life, if we are going to approach the crucifixion of Jesus, the lens of Paul from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians is a lens that will give us the foundation to face both of those world-changing events. We've been following Moses through the course of his journey with God, and, and we remember all of the marvelous things that have happened in his life. There are these major transitions that occur that, that change the arc of what his life might have been. From Pharaoh wanting all male children two years and under killed, from Moses being raised in the palace, from Moses being called by God out of that burning bush that's not consumed. There are all these major transitions. He, he, kills, a, a, he, he kills an Egyptian slave master and runs for his life. He gets married. He, he becomes a keeper of the sheep. And, and then he becomes the one who goes at God's call to confront Pharaoh. After 400 years of slavery, demanding that Pharaoh let God's people go. He raises a staff, the seas part, they cross into the wilderness for 40 years. Moses leads these people through the wilderness and now we get to the end of the story. 
And how does God show God's love for Moses? God takes Moses to the top of the mountain, Mount Pisgah. And God spreads out, I think, God's arms to all the lands that Moses can see from here to here and there to there and here to there and there to here. He says, Moses, this is, this is the finish line to all the work that you have done. This is, this is what your journey has been leading up to. And, and you're not the one to cross over. Rather, I will have you lay your hands on Joshua. And Joshua will receive your blessing. And, and Joshua will lead, will lead the people over into this land of promise that you've been journeying towards for so many years. And then Moses dies. Isn't it supposed to be in the Bible where, where all the endings work out well for those who stay faithful? Especially for those who really give their entire lives to the service of God. Shouldn't it be that, that Moses is at a point where God's going to put a big gold medal around his neck? That, that God is going to award him with, um, what, what's the Powerball right now? I think 500 million or something. I mean, wouldn't that be? I mean... Wouldn't you expect that, as the scripture will say towards the end of Deuteronomy, after all this occurs, there was never a prophet again in Israel like Moses who knew God face to face, and yet here they stand at the top of the mountain at the end of the journey, and how does God show God's love for Moses? Look at all that's in front of you. That's, that's not how we celebrate final transitions as human beings. See, what, what God could have done with Moses, as Moses is preparing to retire from this life to the next, God should have said, oh Moses, remember that time when Pharaoh told you no, and you said, you better not tell me no, and Pharaoh said no, and you said, I'm bringing a, pl- a plague of frogs on your land. And then frogs just went all over everyone. Wasn't that great? You did great there, Moses. And then, and then remember that time? When, you know, I called you up the mountain, I was giving you the Ten Commandments, and, you know, they're going to last forever, those Ten Commandments. So that was kind of a big deal. It was like the covenant. And then I saw your people, like, worshiping a golden calf, and I was going to destroy them. And you stood right in front of me and said, God, you change your mind. And remember when I changed my mind? That was great, Moses. That that was brave. You, You had it all going on. Because... Because that's what we do. We, we look back at what we've accomplished. And friends, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I want us to understand how God shows Moses God's love today. God doesn't look back at everything they've accomplished together and say, Moses, this is what has earned you this wonderful reward of, of reaching into eternity. Instead, God shows Moses God's love by saying, look at everything that is in front of the people you have led. Look at the future. They now stand at the threshold to move into. And know that the arc of your story has been foundational to the future that they will now receive. How does that change our understanding of greatest love? How does it change our understanding of what it means to live a life of purpose and meaning? How does it change how we think about the last chapter of life? Are we hoping that we will have written the great American novel and, and our, name will be, our name will be known for ages and upon ages upon ages that college students will resent because they will have to read this long, boring book that we wrote that's considered a classic? Is that what we want? Do we want to have a big building and, and, and have a plaque with our name slapped on the side of it? Showing all future generations that somebody in the past was so revered that their name is on a building. Do do we want to have some level of, uh, of, of a perfect life Look what they reached in their lives. Look look at the goals that they met. Is, Is that how we understand what it means to 
to live a good life? Make no mistake, God loves Moses. Again, at the end of Deuteronomy, there has never again arisen such a prophet as Moses who knew the Lord face to face. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. But it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. You suppose that was enough for Moses on the top of that mountain? God's love that is guaranteed never to end? That it was okay with Moses that God didn't give him a gold watch or, or a, a platinum parachute? <laughs> you suppose love... The greatest love was enough. We celebrate World Communion today. And you and I will probably never go to the four corners of the earth. We may never go to outer Slobovia. We may never go to tiny towns in Czechoslovakia or Buda or Pest. We never... We may never go to any of those small places where people like you and me live and try to do their best just like we try to do our best. So what connects us? Because I will tell you, I don't think we have a world that's very connected right now. I think what we have is a world that seeks to see the worst in those we don't know and we don't live beside. So we choose to see the worst in anyone who's different. But that's not, that's not what God sets out as the foundation of what's most important for the whole of our lives, not just for certain chapters. We might think that as Moses reached this particular age that we see him today, the scripture says that his vigor was unabated and his eyesight was not dim. So doesn't he get to retire And sit on a beach somewhere? Or is it that God knows that God's involvement and call on our lives really never ends? Just like God's love for us never ends. And it's, it's not that love that says that as long as you do everything okay, everything will turn out exactly the way you want it. You'll have a perfect life with a perfect portfolio, with a perfect house, with a perfect spouse, and then you'll die happy. No, that's not the kind of love that's defined. It's a love that goes far deeper than that. Why do we use that scripture at weddings? Because a a part of what we want those two people to know. As they come to be blessed by the faith community. As they come to to be a part of the body of Christ. As they they come to receive this covenant with God. We want them to know that the love that they share is a love that is, is supposed to grow. Through struggle and heartache. And that it's a love that's based more on giving. Than it is receiving. Now on that day of their wedding. With stars in their eyes. It may not make a whole lot of sense. But down the line. When something traumatic happens. Down the line when they face those. Those struggles that every marriage faces. Down the line when. When they're not sure how their kids are going to live through whatever it is that they've made as a choice. Maybe they remember those words. You know what love is. I think that's what Jesus is praying the disciples know as Jesus takes them to that final Passover we know as the Last Supper. 
I think that's why in Mark's gospel there's so much time shown and so many details shown of how Jesus wants preparations made for that last supper. At Mark's gospel it's a bit more detailed than any other gospel and it's different. In this one it's not, it, it, it's not about going and, and finding the donkey and then taking the donkey and Jesus rides into town and then, and then they go to an upper room. In this one Jesus says when the disciples say where shall we make preparations for the Passover, Jesus very specifically tells them to go into the town and to find a man carrying a water jar and to ask him, where is it that Jesus is to, is to have the Passover meal? And that there will be a guest room that the man has. And there the disciples are, go, are to go and make preparations. You know, I, I talked last week a little bit about the, the last interaction Jesus has before he takes that palm parade into Jerusalem for the final time. It's also interesting to me the different versions of the Last Supper that the Gospels have. In this one, after the preparations are made, and I I didn't have Pastor Cheryl read those intervening verses, where it says that Jesus looks at all of them around that table and says, someone here will betray me. And and they all say, well, it won't be me. I mean, it's not not me. I'm not going to be the one. And it's after they have that interaction that it says Jesus then takes a loaf of bread and breaks it. And he gives it to them and says, this is my body. And then he takes the cup and he gives thanks and he blesses it. And he says, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for many. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it new. In God's kingdom. The disciples don't understand. Jesus is really at the same place where Moses is. Jesus is, he's standing at the top of this spiritual mountain. And he sees before him not only the crucifixion. I think he sees the resurrection. And I think he sees these disciples who are surrounding the table. As those who are the future of the way of Jesus. And I don't think that vision has stopped. I think Jesus continues to see every generation of people who come around the table. Whether they live in the United States or in Africa or in Southeast Asia. Or wherever around the world they live. Sees those of us gathering around the table and sees in us a future. Not all the past, whether it's been good or bad. God has received that into God's heart. But it's about a future that God yet even today envisions. A future that Jesus has in his heart. (laughs) Hear it again. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not insist on its own way. It does not rejoice in the worst of us. It rejoices in the truth of us. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That's what Jesus symbolizes at this table. That Jesus' love in God for us never ends. And the, and the question for us is, does our love for one another end when things get tough? Does our love for one another end when it gets when it gets messy, when, when it gets imperfect, when things don't work out the exact way that we want them to work out. We're invited to see in both the birth, life, and death of Moses the love of a God that moves beyond what the world might consider success or failure but a God who promises Moses in every step of the journey, I will be with you. And even in the end, when you don't cross the finish line that you were expecting to cross, the future 
is there because of you and of your work. I think that Je- that's what Jesus is preparing the disciples for. I think it's what the life of Jesus means at its heart. I think it's why Paul wrote this love chapter. The entire 13th chapter, in, in some ways we might say, is so unlike Paul. <laughs> because Paul is trying to deal with new churches and, and how it is that they're going to exist together. And, and people are struggling and they're fighting and they want to know who's most important and who has the most important gifts. And we'll look at that next week most particularly. And right in the middle of all of that, Paul puts this 13th chapter. And it just has that amount of short verses. Maybe one more time. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic power, And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith so as to remove mountains. But have not love. I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor. And render my body up to the flames. So that I may boast. But have not love. I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will end. Because we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will disappear. When we were children, we thought like children. We reasoned like children. We spoke like children. But now that we are adults, we have put childish ways behind us. Now we see in a mirror dimly. Then we shall see face to face. Now we know in part. Then we will know completely, even as we have been completely known. And these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. And especially on this World Communion Sunday, the greatest of these is love. Amen. Speak.
reminded of one who God's love has made us one. God's love has made us one. invitation to the table from Jan Richardson for World Communion. To your table you bid us come, O God. You have set the places, you have poured the wine, and there is always room, you say, for one more. And so we come. From the streets and from the alleys we come. From the deserts and from the hills we come. From the ravages of poverty, from the palaces of privilege we come. Running, limping, carried, We come. We are bloodied by our wars and wearied with our wounds. We are we carry our dead within us and we reckon with their ghosts. We hold the seeds of healing, we dream of a new creation, we know the things that make for peace, and we struggle to give those things wings. And yet to your table we come, hungering for your bread, we come, thirsting for your wine, we come. Singing your song in every language, speaking your name in every tongue, in conflict and in communion, in discord and in desire, we come. O God of wisdom, we come. We do come because we are invited to this table. Invited by a God whose love moves ever before us. A God who indeed came in the mystery of the fully divine Jesus Christ who announces his ministry by defining it from the prophet Isaiah. I've come to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to announce at the time had come when God would save God's people. And he left that synagogue and he lived that ministry. He fed the hungry, he healed the sick, he ate with the broken and the sinful. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, God gave birth to the church and continues continues to free us from our bondage to sin and death. On a night that Jesus would give himself up for us, a night that would see his friends betray him and deny him and scatter in abandonment and fear. Yet knowing what was in their hearts, the Gospel of John tells us he took a towel and a pitcher and a bowl and he knelt before each of those disciples to wash their feet. Only servants behaved in such a way. The disciples protested. That the king of kings and lord and lords would do this. And he said, I do this so you'll remember. I came not to be served, but to be a servant of all. And as I'm doing, I invite you to do as well. And then they shared a Passover meal together where they remembered God's mighty acts of power to free God's people from slavery and the covenant that God gave them. And after the meal was over, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And giving thanks to God, he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat, each one of you, in remembrance of me. And again, after the supper was over, he took the cup, and giving thanks to God, he blessed and he poured, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim with our lips and as we firm each day as we live our lives, this foundation that is, that is the great mystery of our faith. If you would repeat after me, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with each other and one with you and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet. With Christ, in Christ, and through Christ, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. And with confidence as of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus first taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite those of you who are worshiping virtually uh, to take whatever it is that you have chosen to be a part of the body of Christ this morning. And I would invite you to break off a piece of cracker or bread or toast. And if you would take a cup, it can be filled with juice or with wine or with water or with tea. And if you would take uh, the loaf and dip it in the cup and take and eat in the knowledge and understanding that God knows you by name, by heart, by spirit, and by soul, and God seeks to feed you, that you in turn might have the strength to go out and feed God's world with goodness, grace, and forgiveness in Jesus' name. For those of you who are worshiping here tonight, uh, these um, communion cups and wafers have been blessed, and we will have them at the uh, exit as you leave, and you may take one of these and receive communion uh, as you go. And let's pray together. Loving and living God, we give you grateful thanks for this gift of Holy Communion. We give you thanks for our brothers and sisters around the world who perhaps are celebrating in in different languages and in different ways, and yet their faith, like ours, is as authentic and truthful as we can make it. We are indeed your family, your beloved children, as you have called us, and we seek to do your bidding and your will, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would invite you who are worshiping virtually to turn to those who are next to you and show them signs of love and acceptance and kindness. And I would invite you, those of you who are here tonight worshiping, if you would turn and wave to each other uh, some air high fives, some air fist bumps, um, and know that God indeed has received each one of us in the gift of life. And now, as we close our service, let's sing together. As we gather at your table, as we live, depth and breadth of God's love will never be fully comprehended by we human beings. And that's a good thing. It is God's grace for each one of us. So go out from this place to live the life that God has given you filled with a kind of spirit that gives God's love to the world. Go in grace and go in peace. Amen. Amen.